Making Linux TCP fast, along with my co-workers Neil Carwell uh, from Google, and this all starts from a story of sort of uh, when you receive an ACK, what do you do in the TCP stack? And over time, we have changed how it process this ACK considerably for to evolve uh, and deploy new features. So first thing we do is basically process the ACK information and then take out uh, whatever packet that has been sort of acknowledged, right? This is all defined in the standard RC 793, nothing new here. Um, but then uh, we go and try to detect losses, if any. So that's sort of for the reliability part, and that part we have changed. And then we go on to ask the congestion control, okay, now we have know what to retransmit, what the new data we want to send, and how fast do we send. And then there is this uh, very uh, high performance packet scheduler to sort of send out the packets at exactly the rate. Yeah, yeah sorry. At the, exactly the rate that we wanted to send to. Um, so for the loss recovery, I think people are probably familiar with this thing called the due back threshold, which uh, essentially is that if you receive three due backs, then some packets probably lost, and then you need to retransmit sort of the first unact packet. We are all familiar with that. But over time, this is, has seen its uh, limit, um, primarily because uh, for a short flows, you don't get to count three due backs. Or when you have reordering, then this number, metric number three, is kind of wrong. Um, and we have deployed this new thing called rack, which in terms of just counting the number of out of all the packets, we essentially monitor when the packet was sent. And you can imagine that every packet you send, you put sort of a timer on it, and when it expires, then you retransmit the packet. And the example is that, then suppose you send just two packets, P1 and P2, and then you get an acknowledgement of P2. So you know that P1 probably should have been delivered because at least one RTT has passed, and if you didn't hear anything, then you sort of wait for, like, a reordering window could be a quarter of RTT, and if you still don't hear any news about that p first packet, then you retransmit. And this idea works very well. It actually reduces the number of timeouts in the disordered state in TCP, which means that you receive some out-of-order delivery, and so you're in this disordered state. It could be reordering, it could be lost, you couldn't quite determine what to do. Um, and a lot of time, if you didn't count enough due backs, you would resort to timeouts. But this uh, rack uh, approach has effectively reduced uh, this timeout by a large percentage. And we have defined a RFC uh, draft there in um, the slides, and you can look at the details. But now we have looked at what packet should be retransmitted, and then we have to go ask the congestion control, how fast do I want to send all this retransmission or the new packets? And that's what the job of congestion control do, and that's why we spend a lot of time decoupling the two, uh, like the loss recovery module and the congestion control module. And before we talk about congestion control, let me start with some s description of what is congestion, right? And we all start with this uh, uh, graph that's simple. You have a sender and a receiver going through a bottleneck. And then as you send faster and faster, when you finally reach the bottleneck rate, say 100 megabits per second, the queue starts to form. And in the meantime, you know, the ads are still uh, coming back. And if you look at you know, the spacing of the ad, that kind of gives you a sense of how fast the, pay, uh, the packets are being delivered. So this is standard network one, two, three, nothing fancy about it. And then at this time, if you actually look at sort of this uh, amount of packets in flight, and its relation to the delivery rate. Initially, when you start, you know, as long as you crank up the rate, and then the rate will keep increasing until you reach the 100 megabits per second, right? And then the, the rate kind of plateaus, and everything access you send into the network just turns into queues. 
So the amount of inflow will continue to grow until it hits the buffer size. And there you get all this you know, packet losses due to uh, packet overflow. And in the meantime, if you look at a similar graph, but instead of looking at the delivery rate, you look at the RTT, the data to act time. Right? The RTT initially starts when you start sending and then really uh, max out the bottleneck rate. The RTT will sort of be essentially the two-way propagation delay. And it um, it's, remains constant until the bottleneck is saturated and the queue starts to build and then the RTT just starts to shoot up. Um, and that's sort of where we start from building this new congestion protocol where people have heard about, it's called BBR. But before we talk about BBR, let's look at what the current sort of default cubic or Reno, this loss-based congestion control works. The way they work is that they work at the regime where when you receive a packet loss as a signal, and then you react to that, right? And the problem with that is that the operating point of that is on this far right edge of um, the buffer size, when you reach the buffer size, and then he takes some actions to try to keep the congestion control low. Then there is immediately two problems. First, what if the buffer is really big, and which we have all heard about is this thing called buffer bloat, right? The buffer can be way much bigger than the BDP. This is graph doesn't really run to the scale. Um, in reality, we have seen that the buffer size is 100 times bigger than the BDP. And when you have that much of infly in the network, so goes with your RTT. That goes just into Vazoo, uh, which is, we're talking about tens of seconds sometimes. So that's one problem. It causes this huge amount of queue in the network. Um, and then there is sort of a counter side of this problem is, what if packet loss is not caused by this buffer overflow or not caused by a persistent queue, right? So for shallow buffers we have used in our Google Backbone network, a lot of time the losses are actually driven by correlated traffic bursts. Like lots of flows all sending a small amount of, uh, say, a couple kilobytes, but there are a lot of flow coming in. And then that causes all these losses. But once this burst actually flows through the network, then the congestion is gone. And if you think that the way the renal cubic works is every time he hit the loss, then he cut the rate by you know either half or like twenty uh, percent. And it only takes a few losses, so the false buffer overflow signal, to get the rate way down to um, less than the bottleneck link rate. And there is this famous formula published by uh, Matt Matthews saying that with renal cubic, essentially the throughput is sort of the inverse square root of loss rate. So what that means is that imagine you have a 10 Gbps link of 100 millisecond RTT. You can only lose one packet out of 30 million packets in order to achieve that rate. And it's basically very, very difficult to operate a network that has such low drops. So what we like to do is do we what? In this kind of graph, right, this applies to any network, not just uh, a particular network. One would be the ideal uh, operating point that we would like to operate at. And, sorry, I'm getting some technical problems. It's not moving. Uh, it's asking me to install some update. <laughs> <laughs> you can just ignore it. Um, but I can change the. Do I? No. Uh, maybe. That work now? Yeah, this is working. Okay. So the idea of operating point, I think, is pretty intuitive. Is we want to maximize the bandwidth while minimizing the queues. And that's where the red circle is about. And there is actually mathematical proof about that uh, by Gale and uh, Cranrock done in the 1980s. That, that shows that this is called the network power. And when you have reached this uh, network power for every flow, which is the local optimal, 
then globally, the network will reach its optimal state because everyone is operating at the maximum seeing the, their bottleneck bandwidth while minimizing the local queue. And this can add up to a global optimal. And now the question is, how do we get to that optimal point without relying on, say, the losses? And this is what my uh, colleague, uh, Neil Carl, will show you how BBI will approach that. Thank you. See if this works. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see. Do we just hit the arrow key here? Yeah. So oh, let's go back one second. So the the first thing we notice here is that the uh, this optimal uh, operating point here is at the point where the amount of data that you have in flight in the network is equal to something called the BDP or bandwidth delay product. Now the BDP, the bandwidth delay product, is literally just the bottleneck bandwidth times um, the round trip propagation delay of the path. And um, so we want to talk about um, how we can estimate where that optimal point is. We basically need to figure out what the bottleneck bandwidth is and what the round trip propagation delay is. So um, one straightforward way to estimate these things is basically using some simple filtering. So if we first want to find out the uh, two-way propagation delay of the network, um, based on the graph at the top, you can sort of see, you know, in the real world, you're going to get a bunch of round trip time samples that are these gray dots that are sort of above the constraint line. And one simple way to get a pretty decent estimate of the round trip propagation delay is just to run a min filter over the recent uh, window of samples that you've received over some recent time period. And that will give you a reasonable estimate for the two-way propagation delay. And correspondingly, if you want to know the bandwidth of the path, uh, you know, you can take a look at the delivery rate samples that you get um, based on all the acknowledgments you're receiving. And you can take a look at those delivery rate samples, and they're going to look like these uh, gray dots on the bandwidth graph here. And so one way to get a reasonable estimate of the uh, available bandwidth for this flow is to take a max filter um, that's winded over the, some recent number of round trip times to uh, figure out the, uh, an estimate for the bandwidth available to the flow. So. So that's great. But one interesting problem with this is that um, if you want to see both the maximum bandwidth and the minimum round trip time, it turns out you need to spend some time on both sides of that optimal point. Because over on the left side, um, only the minimum round trip time is visible because you've only got enough, because uh, you don't really have enough uh, packets in flight to actually fully utilize the bandwidth of the path. Um, and then interestingly, on the other side of the BDP, if you've got enough data in flight that you're sure you've uh, filled the pipe, then there's going to be at least a little bit of queue there that's going to be essentially hiding the two-way propagation delay from you. So if you want to understand both parameters, you actually need to spend a little time on each side of that um, BDP point. So, so putting this all together, um, one uh, reasonable way to uh, try to stay near this optimal point where we're getting maximum bandwidth and minimum delay um, kind of looks like this. So first we try to build an explicit model of the network path that has both important parameters. It has both the bottleneck bandwidth estimate and the estimate of the two-way propagation delay. And we can update those on every ACK because on every ACK we're going to get an RTT sample and we've added code to also get a delivery rate sample. And once you've got your model, then you can use that model to control how fast you send. And interestingly, you need to do at least a couple different things, it seems, to make this work. So um, as I just mentioned, you're going to need to probe both the maximum bandwidth which, uh, with in-flight above BDP. And you're also going to need to probe the minimum uh, round trip time to get an estimate of the two-way propagation delay. And that means you're going to have to spend at least a little time with your in-flight below the BDP. Um, and second, um, to get this to work well, you want to pace at a rate so that you're sending packets into the network at a rate that's close to the bottleneck bandwidth, which is going to reduce the amount of queuing you create, reduce the amount of packet loss. And then third, to make this all fit together, you're going to need to vary the pacing rate to keep the amount of data in flight in the network close to the BDP so that you get um, a full pipe but small queues. So if we put all this together, 
then that's basically BBR congestion control in a nutshell. Um, and BBR stands for bottleneck bandwidth and round trip propagation time. So our team at Google, uh, including Ben Jacobson and Yu Chang and myself, um, we've been working on this and um, we've uh, submitted the code. It's, it's in uh, NetNext right now, slated for um, 4.9. And we got a paper coming out in the next week or two uh, in ACMQ giving some more details if you're still interested after this talk. Um, so if we had to summarize BBR in one sentence, um, I think we could say that BBR seeks high throughput with a small Q by sequentially probing both the bottleneck bandwidth and the round trip time to build a model. So what does that look like? So let's go back to our favorite graph here. So we're going we're gonna to build a model and we're going to try to stay near the maximum bandwidth and the minimum round trip time. We're going to try to stay as close as possible to this optimal operating point which is right around the BDP. So to make this work, BBR has a state machine and um, every connection starts out in a mode that we call startup, where it's basically trying to rapidly probe the bandwidth available in the network so that we can, we can quickly reach full utilization. So what BBR does is it um, starts with the whatever initial congestion window the TCP stack thinks is reasonable. It's sort of an orthogonal problem. Um, and then it basically doubles its sending rate every round trip time um, as long as the delivery rate is also doubling every round trip time. And the, the doubling every round trip time, of course, is, is very similar to the behavior you get with uh, traditional TCP slow start. Where the, interest, where, the dif where the difference is more interesting is that um, as BBR is doing this, it's looking at what's happening to the delivery rate. And it's only going to double its sending rate as long as it sees that the delivery rate is also exponentially growing. And once it sees that the bandwidth samples that it's getting are actually, they've actually stopped growing exponentially, then it estimates that the pipe is probably full and it switches to the next mode in its state machine, which we call uh, drain. Um, because its job is basically to drain the queue that is inevitably um, created if the first mode it's, um, is filling the pipe, which it almost always does. So the idea is that um, when this mode starts out, there's going to be some amount of queue. So the drain mode uses a pacing rate that's below the estimated bottleneck bandwidth so that gradually the, uh, the amount of data in flight decreases. And once the amount of data in flight has um, decreased to the estimated BDP, we estimate that the pipe is full, but the queue is very small. And then we can um, proceed on to the next uh, state in the state machine, which we call probe BW, um, because it's, it's got a couple jobs here. But the main job, of course, is to explore bandwidth to see how much uh, more bandwidth is available, if any. And then after that, it tries to drain the queue that might be created by that process. And then it tries to cruise with high utilization and a low queue. So how does this work? So um, the first, this works in a sort of cycle. And it goes through a couple, of the, goes through each of these phases that we just described. So in the first phase of the cycle, we start out um, somewhere near the BDP. And then what we need to do is briefly, for one estimated round, round trip time, we use a pacing rate that's a small multiple of the bottleneck bandwidth. So we use, you know, right now we're using 1.25 times the estimated bottleneck bandwidth for about one round trip time. And what that does is, since we're sending faster than the network is delivering, the amount of data in flight is going to increase. Now, uh, one or two things will happen here. Either there's more bandwidth that really is available, in which case, uh, since we're max filtering the bandwidth samples to get our bandwidth estimate, we will immediately notice that, and that will be our new bandwidth estimate, and it will increase the sort of baseline rate at which we're sending immediately. Um, on the other hand, if we don't have any more bandwidth available, then the fact that we sent faster than the available bandwidth will have created a little queue in the network, and BBR tries to run with a low queue, so the next thing we do is to dissipate that queue, we spend uh, one round trip time sending at a rate that's below the estimated bottleneck bandwidth, and specifically it's correspondingly below. So we send it 0.75 times the bottleneck bandwidth, which um, will then drive the in-flight down, back down toward the BDP. Um, 
And then once we've drained that queue, if any, then we spend some time cruising at um, essentially exactly the estimated bottleneck bandwidth, which is going to tend to fully utilize the pipe, but keep the queue nice and small. So this is um, actually where a typical BBR flow, uh, at least one that lasts more than a few seconds, is going to spend most of its time just probing the bandwidth and keeping the queue small. Um, now, what everything I've described so far is about pushing out to the right of this curve, keeping the in-flight a little higher than BDP or at BDP so that we can probe bandwidth and you fill the pipe. But of course, we've got the other part of this equation, which is the model of the, the two-way propagation delay. And to see that, as we've mentioned, you need to actually have your in-flight below the BDP. So there's sort of two interesting cases here, right? Um, so we, our uh, RTT estimate is based on a min filter that's running over um, currently 10 seconds. So the interesting thing is that um, a lot of applications actually are going to be application limited or basically run out of data to send over the course of a 10 second window, right? So when you download a web page, um, if you've got RPC traffic, if you've got video traffic that's cut into chunks, maybe because you want to change your bit rate potentially. So in all those cases, you've got traffic that's basically going to have some period of silence pretty often so that that silence itself will tend to drain the queue and give the uh, flow a chance when it restarts for those first few packets to make it through the network and give you a good uh, minimum RTT sample because those first couple packets restarting after idle um, are going to have an in-flight that's much lower than the BDP. So, so for many applications, you don't need, you need to do anything special at all uh, for the min RTT filter to sort of opportunistically pick up a good sample. Now, if you do have a bulk transfer application that's going to be sending at full bore for the entire 10 second window, then probe RTT mode is designed to notice this and on a sort of as needed basis, um, when it sees that the min RTT estimate has not been matched or um, made better over the course of 10 seconds, then it briefly drops into this probe RTT mode and cuts the amount of data in flight to a sort of minimal value and then gets a good min RTT sample and then flips the in flight back up to our BDP and goes back into probe BW state. And the parameters of this mode are chosen so that um, the typical impact for a bulk transfer flow is small. So obviously since in-flight is below BDP, there's going to be some brief underutilization, but the parameters are chosen to typically limit that impact to about 2%. So that's basically BBR in a nutshell, and that's you know one way that a congestion controller can estimate a good rate at which to send packets through the network. So once congestion control has figured out a good rate, then the next part of the picture in the Linux TCP architecture is that we hand off the packets to the uh, packet scheduler. So in Linux TCP, the, um, this part of the picture kind of looks like this now. It starts out at the top in the TCP layer where you've got um, we've got a red and a green and a blue flow. And here in the TCP layer, we can see the write queues, which are filled with um, maximally sized SK buffs or SKBs. And so our first job is basically to pick out a, a, a burst size that we think is appropriate for this flow. And that's the job of something called TSO auto sizing, which basically looks at the send rate of the flow and picks out a burst size that makes sense one that's proportional to the rate of the flow. So flows that are half a gigabit or above, they get nice big SKBs, 64 kilobytes. For slower flows, they get proportionally smaller bursts. So once you've chopped off an SKB of a good size, then you, you have another question, which is, OK, is now a good time to hand this off to the lower layers, or should I wait? So the, the part of the system that decides that is called TCP small queues which is basically like a little flow control engine to limit the amount of data that's in the queues of the sending host. Um, and when it decides that now is a good time, then TCP hands off the packet to the lower layers. So it goes through IP and then to the QDisk layer. Um, now at the QDisk layer, the most interesting case, the most full featured QDisk is one called FQ, uh, which actually offers two services, basically. The first layer that you hit is the pacing layer, which basically decides the appropriate release time for each SKB based on the pacing rate set by the congestion control module. 
And then once we've reached that release time, then it releases it to the ferry queuing component of FQ, which is going to mix the packets from the different flows in a way that's fair on a byte by byte basis, which reduces head of line blocking and also gives the mice a chance, um, a better chance. So once fair queuing has decided it's ready, it hands off the packet to the NIC and then it heads on to the wire. So that's basically the system. So if we, if we think about the, the loss recovery and congestion control and packet scheduling modules all together, what is that bias these days? What does that look like in terms of performance? So first, it allows us to fully utilize the bandwidth offered by the path, even when there's high packet loss. So this is just a graph to kind of illustrate the, prop the scaling properties now. So um, on the y-axis, we have good put here in megabits per second. On the x-axis, uh, loss rate in percent. We have on the left, we've got a thousandth of a percent. We have on the right, 50%. So this is comparing um, BBR and cubic for a bulk test uh, with one flow. Um, and this had a 100 megabit um, bottleneck with 100 millisecond round trip time. But the curve is going to look pretty similar no matter what the, the bandwidth. So the first thing to notice here is this um, property of loss-based congestion control, including cubic, that Yu Chung mentioned, where you need a really low loss rate to get um, a good throughput with loss-based congestion control. Um, and in fact, uh, but the other thing to notice is that BBR is able to achieve the full um, bandwidth offered by the path at up to about 5%, and even up to about 15%, you get the maximum theoretically possible, given that there is some packet loss happening. And above that, of course, they both do poorly, but the, the place at which BBR's throughput falls off is should be noted is actually a design parameter. It's not a fundamental property of the algorithm. So what does this look like at sort of typical realistic um, numbers? So if we, if we consider this uh, a sort of 10 gigabit bottleneck with 100 millisecond round trip time and a 1% loss rate, which is kind of realistic for what we see with commodity shallow buffered switches on our backbone, um, Cubic is going to give you about 3.3 megabits on a path like that. Uh, BBR is going to give you about 9.1 gigabits. So it's about a three order of magnitude difference in the bandwidth that you can see in a, in a case like this with um, uh, shallow buffers giving you these uh, non-congestive losses. Um, so. so the next thing to, that um, is interesting is the picture now uh, on last mile style links. So. What this new architecture buys you is the ability to have low queuing delay despite um, buffers that might be really, really bloated. So here the graph is just showing um, the median uh, RTT latency uh, on the uh, y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the buffer size sort of ranging from 100 kilobytes over on the left to 10 megabytes over on the right. Um, again, the, the graph is going to look the same no matter what the, uh, the bandwidth. In this case, it happened to be we were looking at sort of 2G style bandwidths with 128 kilobit uh, bottleneck. Um, and here we had eight flows running for a while to give a sense of what happens. And of course, what happens is, as Yu Chung noted, um, loss-based congestion control operates uh, by basically filling the buffers and just riding there. So. As you increase the size of your buffers, the queuing delay that you're going to see in a FIFO queue uh, just grows in proportion with that buffer size if you're running cubic. Um, by contrast, BBR, because it builds an explicit model of the amount of data in flight that you really need, of course, that's independent of the buffer size. That has to do with the, the, um, the bandwidth and the, the round trip propagation delay, which doesn't change. So the amount of data in flight doesn't change in the case of the BBR. So it can give you some nice low delays. So for a typical example might be uh, a 10 megabit last mile link with a 40 millisecond round trip time. Um, in a case like that, BBR is going to give you a median RTT of about 43 milliseconds and cubic is going to give you an RTT, a median RTT of about one second. So it's about a um, 25x improvement in um, latency. Um, so um, those were just to, to illustrate the basic properties. Um, we actually deployed um, BBR for all of the TCP traffic um, running on Google's B4 network. 
which is a backbone network that connects um, all of the Google data centers and carries the majority of traffic between Google data centers these, these days. So, um, and what does the performance look like with that? So, um, with BBR we see about two times to 20 times the performance of Cubic. Um, and it turns out that actually right now, the BBR performance is basically limited um, by the maximum receive window that's been configured on these hosts. And if you uh, go in and, and uh, have root on enough machines and do some experiments, we found that basically um, BBR, once you've lifted that receive window limit, it gets about 100 times the bandwidth that Cubic gets uh, on this network. So, uh, in conclusion, um, let me switch to our new conclusion slides. There we go. In conclusion, um, there have been changes at both the algorithmic level and the architectural level in Linux TCP um, the, as it's evolved over the past couple of years. And um, in congestion control, we've got a new congestion control algorithm that's available that um, tries to maximize bandwidth and minimize the round trip time by building an explicit model instead of being loss-based. And in the loss recovery world, we've got a new algorithm, Rack, that basically uh, uses time-based reasoning to work more generally and to do a better job at recovering all losses or most losses in, in one round trip time. And this is all, of course, based on a foundation of a high-performance packet scheduler. Um, and we should give a shout out to Eric Dumaze, who wrote basically all of these components. Um, this includes the uh, FQ QDisk, which offers uh, fair queuing and pacing. Um, the TSO auto sizing subsystem and the TSQ flow control system. Um, and when you put this all together, you've got a system that uh, offers orders of magnitude higher bandwidth and, and lower latency than what was possible before. So next step, um, we, we, as I said, we've deployed this on our internal backbone, but we are now in the process of deploying this for Google.com and uh, YouTube traffic. and. Um, with a certain amount of tuning and testing, we hope maybe it can be deployed uh, more widely on the internet. Um, and uh, this the Rack and BBR are both on undergoing ongoing development, so we'd love to have your help, uh, both with code and testing. You know, help us make these better. Uh, we've got a URL for a BBR dev um, mailing list, which is a public mailing list for anyone interested in discussing or sharing test results, that kind of thing. So, um, so thank you. Any questions? Do you want to? Yeah, given we have multiple flows operating at max throughput, and you're probing for additional bandwidth, do you intelligently schedule the probes so that it doesn't create um, latency peaks or something like that? Yeah. So the um, the gain cycling, this probing for other ex, uh, extra bandwidth, it's uh, it's randomized, so that different flows are doing it at, at different times, um, and so that tends to help out with that. Yeah. Um, uh, this looks almost too good to be true. That's uh, great. Uh, <laughs> it's incredible that TCP was designed you know, 40 years ago and still were. Um, so qu a couple of questions, actually. Um, it, for, for a client that's potentially on a low bandwidth network that's not like before, you know, um, uh, have you tested on such a setup? Do you know how well this does? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we've done a lot of testing um, in the lab at low bandwidths, and we've also done uh, several years of testing on YouTube. Um, and actually, on YouTube, most of our test sites, because we're, um, you know, we're cognizant of this as the sort of as one of the challenging areas. Most of our test sites are actually um, uh, in uh, cellular networks in Brazil and in India and places like that with lower bandwidth links. And what we see is that. Um, uh, BBR does a nice job of um, sending based on the available data rate and then bounding the amount of data in flight to be proportional to the uh, estimated BDP that it needs. So we see that, um, yeah, typically BBR is able to match the, uh, the throughput that Cubic will give you, but it cuts the, tends to cut the median round trip time by about a factor of two because it keeps smaller queues. Oh, cool. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, so, coming back to Thomas's question, I think um, if you were if you were to do like uh, um, if, if you didn't have you know anything smart on your client host, you didn't have Cuddle, you didn't have this, you had nothing. Um, 
it sounds like if you have a, a low number of flows, you might be able to get most of the bandwidth of, of FQ Caudal in, in terms of reducing, um, reducing Q latency if you had something like this. Again, if you're a client, not if you're an intermediate router. Yeah, exactly. Um, so clients or servers should be able to benefit from this. Anybody who's doing a lot of sending should be able to benefit from this. And as you say, um, one way to think about it is um, if you don't have FQ Caudal in the path or something like that, BBR does a nice job of keeping the bottleneck queue short, um, you know, even without active queue management. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You didn't say anything about fairness against Cubic or. Right. So, um, yeah, so the, uh, the fairness um, kind of between BBR flows, it kind of looks like this if you look at a picture. You know, the flows start out, they probe, and then what tends to happen is um, they can all basically converge toward uh, the ch an estimate of the uh, round trip propagation delay and an estimate of their fair share of the bandwidth so that um, gradually over time they converge to a very nice uh, fair uh, distribution of the bandwidth. And it turns out that the same um, bandwidth probing and minor TT probing mechanism works to make the system converge toward a fair share of um, bandwidth distribution even if some of the flows are cubic because fundamentally the probe BW is just checking to see you know is there more bandwidth available and then probe RTT is just checking to see okay you know what's the um, what's the round trip time in the system without my traffic in the picture so it gives you a sort of um, round trip time that you need to converge toward your fair share of the available bandwidth. And of course, if the bottleneck buffer is, uh, is deep enough, then of course a, an algorithm like uh, Cubic or Reno is going to tend to put um, more data than is its fair share, more data than is necessary inside that bottleneck link. And so BBR in, is going to get proportionally less uh, bandwidth. But then the, um, you know, we, it's our judgment that that's probably the best direction to go uh, in, in the meantime while they're both, uh, while both congestion control algorithms um, operate simultaneously. Did you test your, the BBR with other TCP implementations in the mixture con con uh, environment like uh, multiple streams using the different TCP algorithms? Yeah, we tested BBR with all the other streams uh, using Cubic uh, and Reno um, so far, and we'd love to have um, you know data points from other folks comp um, testing it alongside other congestion control algorithms as well. So when you say you've tested against Cubic, was that in a high round trip time environment? Because BBR seems to really squeeze out Cubic flows once the RTT gets up about forty milliseconds. Well, the the dynamic, um, in terms of how Cubic and BBR sh uh, share bandwidth, um, I should say two things about it. One is it is it's largely driven by the buffer size. So um, the the current version of BBR um, tends to the algorithm for calculating the congestion window and the sending pacing rate um, is such that it's going to try to keep about one bandwidth delay product of uh, data in flight in the network. So if the buffers are smaller, then indeed that's going to be a little bit too much and that's going to tend to um, crowd out uh, cubic arena flows. And so this is something that we're actively working on uh, at the moment. Um, now if the buffers are deeper, uh, what happens is that um, of course, Cubic and Reno just try to fill those buffers, whereas BBR tries to keep a sane size amount of uh, data in the in the network. So, anytime the buffer is above uh, about uh, twice the bandwidth delay product, Cubic and Reno are actually going to tend to crowd out um, BBR in the way that they're dumping too much data into the network. Um, so, it's sort of a balancing act, um, and we're actively working on um, improving the queue pressure that BBR places on the network. Um, so you think there's a way to resolve that so they can kind of coexist peacefully and not just have sort of a Thunderdome winner takes all? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we, we definitely don't want the Thunderdome scenario. Uh, we're, um, you know, we're not at the end of the road here. We realize there's going to be some um, room for improvement. Absolutely. And we, we, um, 
you know, obviously we want uh, BBR to coexist well with Cubic um, in, you know, any buffer size that, that is reasonable and, and, you know, common out there in the world, which includes shallow buffered switches and, you know, a lot of routers have about a BDP of buffering. We want to make that work well. And we realize that we've, um, we've got some tuning to do in that case. So let's discuss for five minutes. We will have a coffee break after that. So let's talk to the speaker again.